Oh, the red light goes out. Can you hear me? Not yet. It says it's on, but there's no light. Are we, are we low on batteries? Maybe. And I'm gonna leave this up. Actually. Okay, got we got a good red light. Okay, you, you can hear me. Okay. All right. So our next presenter is gonna be Penelope. Uh, she's got her title is Code Hedgehogs Changing the S and SLDC to Secure as opposed to software development lifecycle or systems development lifecycle. Uh, and so uh, basically she, we're going to try, she's going to talk about software, uh, secure software development using a uh, shift left effort and aiming to identify security vulnerabilities early in the development lifecycle. So takeaways from this talk will be ideas on how to engage developers in shifting the security posture of the organization through secure coding with a simple analogy concrete steps at each phase of the SDLC and fun ways to learn how to do it. Uh, quick review on how to uh, inter integrate secure coding at each step of the software development lifecycle and then discuss top application vulnerabilities and mitigation techniques to defend against known attacks. And then there's uh, three different approaches to threat modeling and wrapping up with recommendations on how to try your hand on the other side of gamified bread team challenges where coding skills give you a decided advantage. Penelope is a, an experienced cybersecurity professional and a, a learner and passionate uh, about all things cyber. She has two bachelor's degrees. I didn't. I was going to ask you, yeah. and what were they previously in? So the first one's called Political Economy of Industrial Societies. Okay. <laughs> PEIS. And then the other was, um, I was a K-12, K-12 by the oh. educator. And now a master's in, and, and as well as a master's, and now a degree in cybersecurity and information assurance. Correct. Very good. So she's an active. She is active in the Black Hills Information Security Community. Uh, speaking of, are you going to? Planning to go to Deadwood. Deadwood. Yep. Okay. So there you go. She's going to give a presentation out of a presentation, or yeah, just, just attending? Volunteering. There. Volunteering there. So um, active. So active with Black Hills Information Security Community. And appointed uh, friends of BHIS uh, designation, only known as the Nerd Herders. Yeah. <laughs> Not familiar with that one. So, all right. Uh, you might even stumble upon cameo appearances on the newscasts of, of backdoors and breaches demos found on YouTube or Twitch. She's an educator at heart, excited to share her expertise and audiences whenever given the opportunity. Penelope also has her CompTIA Security Plus and CYSA Plus certs and uh, an adjunct instructor at Northern Kentucky University. In their so, Gen Cyber program. Yeah. In their Gen Cyber program. So welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. And then, oh, not to put any pressure on you, but when you're done, we have lunch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I can keep you entertained long enough to... Uh... Okay. <laughs> well, I was expecting 30 minutes, so let's see how this goes. So you may have noticed he did not say my last name because it is Roshkova, and when people see it, they are just like, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and um, so I married Russian, and uh, I've learned a little bit about the uh, Russian culture, and in Russian, the word anecdote kind of means what it means in English, but it is more like what we use for like to tell a joke. And so that's actually what I want to start with today and give you some insight into why I said uh, code hedgehogs. And so this, uh, let's see, let me go here. Let's see it. Oh. Because the light is, let's see. 
at the laptop. Okay. Yep, I know. We tested it before I started to talk. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Yeah. So the, the pointer's working. There it goes. So it'll go backwards. Oh, there it is. Okay. There's four. All right. So. Uh, apparently. <laughs> All right, so my Russian anecdote. So there's this group of mice who are chatting among themselves, and they say to them, they're talking about like how they have this terrible position in life. They are at the um, bottom of the food chain. They don't like being there anymore. What can we do about this problem that we have about being at the bottom of the food chain? And they're just like, oh. We can't figure it out, but I bet you that wise owl can give us an idea. So the mice head over to the owl, and they ask the owl, and they explain their situation about how they don't like being at the bottom of the food chain, and what can we do to make ourselves um, less vulnerable? And they, uh, the owl says, oh, that's a good question. Let me think about that for a minute. And the owl says, I've got it. You can become a hedgehog. And the mice are like, oh, that's a great idea, isn't it? We have uh, quills. If we're hedgehogs and we can roll up in that ball and, you know, we're not going to be as easily to be grabbed by those mouths because our quills will, like, protect us. That's a great idea. Let's become hedgehogs. And so they walk off and they're so excited and they're just like, oh, my gosh, I want to be a hedgehog. Let's do it. Let's do it. And they stop. And they're like, wait a minute. He didn't tell us how. How are we supposed to be hedgehogs? And so they're like, OK, well, we, let's go back and ask him. And they go back to the owl. And he's just like, yeah, of course I didn't tell you how to be hedgehogs. You know, like, I'm the idea guy. You go figure out how to be a hedgehog. <laughs> so you know, the owl gave them a great idea. But then they didn't know what to do with it. So that's kind of where we are with um, programmers today, right? Programmers. Um, kind of can be the mice in the cybersecurity vulnerability space, right? They are who they are and sometimes don't see the reason to have quills. So, please. Yes, okay. So, um, this talk, hopefully, as uh, Carl said in the introduction, will give you some ideas about how to shift your security posture and give you some talking points for when you're dealing with developers who kind of say, well, we don't need to be hedgehogs. So when we have the secure development lifecycle, whether it's waterfall or agile, um, generally speaking, the security starts at the testing level, right? So um, they have not been thinking with a secure uh, posture in mind as they get started. And when we get to testing and doing quality assurance, that's when it starts to happen. And so we get the dynamic analysis with the tools that are in place, and hopefully the tools work. And uh, you might have some pen testers come in and test it at that point. But the new idea in this area is to ship left. And one of the people I'm going to talk about later says push left, right? Because it depends on the environment of whether they're willingly going to go to the left or if they're going to have to be encouraged to move. But we can start at the beginning. And we can look at our documentation that we have in place that is probably in your risk and governance and figure out how to start this project with the planning um, to begin with. And you can go all the way through the um, life cycle by adding in relevant steps along the whole process that are, encourage a secure posture. And so that by the time you get to that testing, um, that quality assurance level, you've already been thinking about it. And the thing is, when you start early, then it's more cost effective, both in terms of time and money. And then you can move on and make sure that it doesn't just stop at testing, but it is also included in the other steps where you're going to have, you know, when you're in deployment and you have the final security review, you can create that incident response plan and hopefully based on what you've been doing through the previous steps, have it built in there. And then the maintenance part, of course, as well, to have 
your developers in mind of like, oh, these are the kind of the things that are out there. And if the new ones come up, it's not going to be news to them about how this process is working. So along the whole way, you want to keep in your mind um, like the threat modeling process and adjusting your priorities and risk reduction strategies as you move along. So it can be a much more dynamic process. So where do we start, right? So if a developer's like never really had this education, um, when I gave this talk to like a group of students who came up through um, Tech Elevator, and they said, oh, we only got one day on security. And so, you know, it's a 14-week program, it goes fast, they don't necessarily know what that means to secure to code securely. So, you know, start, you know, start with something that's out there, well established. And if you look at these top 10, like nine of them are things that developers could help with, right? Like the insufficient logging and monitoring is like the only one that is not kind of in the programmer's wheelhouse. And you can introduce them to the website, you know, you can take them there and, you know, pick something to show them off your list. And take them through the page. So, um, and if you're in a dynamic situation, I was not going to challenge the demo gods um, and try and do anything live. <laughs> uh, but it breaks it down. So it gives you across the top the threat agents and attack vectors for broken authentication. It gives you the security weaknesses and the impacts of having broken authentication if it's not something that's in the forefront of their minds. Um, then it breaks it down in the next four blocks, right? So for all of these vulnerabilities, there's a page like this at OWASP. You all may already know that, but um, programmers probably don't. And you hear a lot of things from programmers, well, um, I use an obscure code. Um, I don't need to worry about that. Um, oh, you know, it's it's third party. It doesn't really touch anything important. I don't need to worry about that. So if you focus on what you think is likely to happen, um, you're probably going to get um, cause problems for your security team. <laughs> but if you instead focus on what can happen and be prepared, and if you start with that process, as I said, from the beginning with that in mind, like, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know who's out there who wants to um, attack us. Then we need to think about what can happen and not what's likely to happen. So the most common vulnerabilities exploited during uh, pen testing are here. Um, so I am. I got into a cyber security because I was coaching my son's cyber patriot team. Oh, did I? Okay. So I, uh, so cyber patriot, blue team, I love blue team. I like being on, uh, on that side of it. And he, when we first started the team, we went, my first event was B-Site Cincinnati in 2018. And I, play the CTF there, and I just fell in love with cybersecurity. And so that's how I moved from education into cyber, because I, when I, my, my new choice, my son decided, I was a homeschooler, and my son decided to go back to brick and mortar. I was just like, what am I going to be when I grow up? Now I get to choose. And this was like the automatic thing for me, because I just love it all. I, and I love the gamification. And so uh, I am not a coder. One of the first things that I learned in my program was that coding can be really important in cybersecurity, right? Like high school, so I'm kind of the same age as Phil and, and uh, Dr. C here. We had TRS-80s um, in my high school lab. Um, I learned to code BASIC, a little bit of Fortran, COBOL, and Pascal, which I don't think any of that is used, to get, uh, used today. And it was so long ago, it's not like I remember how to code. But, you know, I've had some fun with Python now, and um, I took a little Java. So I can play with code. I can use it when I'm playing my games enough to, like, figure out how to break it. <laughs> and so... That's me, right? I am, if you do not have input validation in your code, I can figure that part out, right? So that's like the easy one, I think, to kind of start teaching your programmers that that's important, right? Um, let's see if this works here. 
Can we push play on that? I don't know if I can do that from here. The square. You guess which spot that goes The square. That's right. Yes. Okay. And how about this rectangle? That one also the square. It goes in there too. Yeah. It was working. <laughs> I'm on a web app and like figure out how to break in. I don't, I'm still at the point where I don't necessarily know what to do on the other side, but I can like get some access. Right? <laughs> so um, I think this is like a great thing to show your coders, right? Like what are the people on the outside going to do when you, you put a form out on your web app and you didn't do input validation because you're like, oh, they know how to read directions. It says to put this in, right? Right. Well, maybe the regular user is going to put things where you want to, but your pen tester is not going to do that. Your script kitties aren't going to do that. And um, it's not secure, right? And if it's someone more malicious than that, you definitely don't want them going in that way. So um, again, so preventing that. SQL injections, there's like a bunch of stuff here that there are probably people in this room who know exactly how to do all those things. But I know that the one thing that can stop me as a new person is validate every user input. And I think that's a great place to start. And I think this is like a place where you can show programmers that it's important to improve your security posture. Um, you can also introduce them to um, MITRE. So, my college program didn't teach me about MITRE. I did it as a special project in my program, right? But if even so cybersecurity professionals in a uh, good program, you know, my I was in a in a CY uh, C. Oh. Sorry. Anyway, the NSA approved uh, education program, right? MITRE never came up in a single one of my classes, and I kept coming to these events, right? And I would hear about it, and I was just like, so I want to thank you out here who have been doing it for teaching me what I wasn't learning at school and I learned about MITRE by coming to these talks, right? So if I'm not learning it in a cybersecurity program that's approved by the NSA, your, your programmers probably aren't. So you could introduce it to them and you can say, look, these are things that can happen, you know, introduced during uh, the design phase or these are the things that are introduced during implementation. Or if they're taught a specific code and you can send them and say like these are the vulnerabilities that might be there if you're using C or Java or PHP, right? There's a lot of PHP out there. And so you have a way to introduce them to things that they might not have been thinking about. In my experience when I've talked to like those tech elevator people, it's not that they're not interested, it's just like, oh, we didn't know. So let's know. And if we know, we can get them on the path to being able to code hedgehogs instead of mice, right? Because if we have mice, it's going to be really hard to turn those web apps that you've created, ignoring the first four steps, ignoring what vulnerabilities are out there, and then expect them to make hedgehogs at the end. So you can introduce them to the idea of threat modeling. My favorite uh, explanation of like the vulnerability versus threat uh, explanation because, you know, I go had lo lots of that for sure in my classes, right? But a very simple way to help keep it clear in your head for me is 
the threat is from the outside. The threat is the thing that is outside of the system, and the vulnerability is the weakness within. And then risk is the intersection of the two. So I think when people can look at it from that way without all of the long explanations of, oh, these are this is a threat, blah, blah, blah. I can't even remember what those classroom ones were, but I know it was a lot of words. <laughs> but that has really helped me. When I learned, when I first heard that explanation, it's just like, oh, it's suddenly clear. So let's make it as simple as possible for them to kind of understand what are the things we're looking at. So then we know what our, you know, hopefully we have some ideas from the things that we just discussed, what some of the vulnerabilities, the internal things are that could be weaknesses of what we are uh, coding. And then let's give them some insight into what the threat model, I mean, what the threats could be. So it could be attacker centric, right? Do you work somewhere where, um, uh, Industrial espionage can be a problem. Do you work somewhere that you're somewhere in the supply line that it could be like, you know, classic espionage that they might want to use your third party to access um, something that's a little more uh, classified or up the uh, international boot chain. Software centric, again, so we talked about like, what are the platforms, what are the components of this, of the um, application that you're building? and have a sense of like what are the weaknesses in your um, components. And then asset centric. Do you have PII in there that people want to get access to? Do you have state secrets that, you know, somewhere down the food chain like that you could get access to? And so giving them a sense of like these are the thoughts that are going through the attacker's minds and what comes up to the surface for what you are creating. So it gives them the background to understand that, you know, how do I identify the known vulnerabilities, the threats, um, how do I understand these risks? And then they can go on and like start deciding like what security controls besides input validation, right, which should just be automatic, <laughs> that they should put into place. How do you uh, prioritize those risks within your organization, right? That's not just, you know, it, the conversations, kind of like what um, Mike was talking about. I, I don't know if um, uh, Dr. C like knew what I was going to really be talking about because I just sent him my slides, but he, I, I love serendipity, right? It's just like, oh my gosh, like my talk, I think it's going to make so much more sense coming after Micah. I could not have planned this better. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> and he was blessed, right? He had somebody in his organization um, who was a security person who had um, that web app background. Um, one of my uh, compatriots who uh, is a strong technical cybersecurity person took his uh, took a job recently, and he's been there a month, and he's like not like loving it, you know. And he's just like, "Couldn't you have done this talk a month ago? Because if you would have been talking about the fact that to be a, a really great web app security person, you should probably have had some development experience first." <laughs> You know, before you try to be that person. And he's a great technical cybersecurity person, but he's not a he's not a developer and he's struggling. So I mean building up our developers, I think, for our need in cybersecurity to get those people already coming in with a uh, secure posture mindset will give us um, a pipeline to bring in better cybersecurity people for the outside. So, um, and if you have those people who already understand the development side and we train them in the cybersecurity side, the priori prioritizing risk and creating a risk reduction strategy are going to be a lot, um, well, they're not going to be easy ever, right? But hopefully a little smoother. So um, the considerations we want to take into effect are, you know, the technologies leveraged by the application, the client-side databases that people might want to be trying to uh, get gain access to, REST, the native programming languages of the app, and the integrations. Again, what third parties are going to be attaching to us. And then we want to look at the, the risks that are non-technical, the loss in terms of time if you have to rewrite it to make it secure, the loss of um, from a branding standpoint or a reputation standpoint if something goes wrong. 
We have the theft that we talked about, which could be the monetary or it could be the information, whether it's um, secrets or uh, personal, uh, the PII. And then again, the delays, right? It's going to be a lot easier to move uh, through the development process and build it in than it is if you have to go back and try and turn your mouse into a hedgehog. So I think, you know, from a business standpoint, it makes sense to train these people early on to have security built in. So then again, the house, right? How do I build secure coding skills? So let's say that they come out of Tech Elevator and um, then what, right? Because they got there one day in class. And even if you're in a four-year university, if you're going down a certain track, there's not necessarily going to be cybersecurity built into your program. So they're a great talk. So again, love serendipity. When I was writing this talk originally, I did it for um, the women who code. Uh, this popped into my feed, right? This DevSecCon 24. 24 hours around the world. They broke it up into the three segments of North America, Europe, and then um, like the uh, Japan, uh, Australia time frame. And so around the clock, you had experts from around the world available to you. And um, it was great. And this was my favorite one here, right? Because again, I like the gamification. So, so I, I recommend to everybody go spend your 20 minutes with Rosemary Wang and play I Spy and Insecure Delivery Pipeline. And it, it doesn't have to be dry, right? It can be fun. So if you want um, something a little more dry, you can go to Bright Talk also and do those searches there. And you're going to find, you know, into, like the, uh, the salespeople who are trying to sell their uh, products, they'll also have it. And you can learn from them too, right? You don't have to buy products to learn how to uh, utilize the, the methodologies. So it's easy to find talks. You can find blogs. So this is a Tanya Janka, and I don't know if I'm saying her name right. And um, I joke that, you know, I don't recommend her just because she has the same color hair that I do, but she's awesome. <laughs> and if you, if you can, I'm not sure if you can read it here, but, you know, so she starts here, like, this bottom one is pushing left. So she's the one who says, you know, you've, I ha and she works in the environment, so she probably knows better than I that you have to push left. Um, and it starts with part one, and she has, like, five, parts, I think, of just the pushing left part. She has up here URL, URL parameters. Um, whatever it is that you're looking for, um, it has safe uh, dependencies. So she has, right here we have 12. There, she has two pages of blog posts. And she is from WeHack uh, Purple. And she created that organization. And um, so right here at just one website, you can get two dozen mini tutorials on how to become a, a better, more secure coder. And then there's my favorite part, right? The games. So again, at the same time that I was like writing this, this is my first experience with this, this company. And so at the, I was attending virtually the um, Way West conference, and they had a CTF there for coding. And I played it a little bit. And again, like I think if I'd been a developer or coder, I would have done much better in it. But I loved it, right? So, um, and when I went in there, what they do is they give you these blocks of code, and they mark a few of them. They say, which piece is the one that is insecure? And so you pick that one. I actually got a couple right. <laughs> and then um, it gives you the opportunity to fix the code, right? So then it gives you um, the option to go in and fix the code. So it can be fun, right? Like it's challenging. You get immediate feedback that, oh, yes, I was able to spot what needed to be fixed. Um, I bet you can't get, guess which piece I found. Um, <laughs> input validation. <laughs> um, and so there are fun things out there to do in order to learn. Um, command and control. So my very first one I, in my account, I was only able to get 75 points in my first event with uh, a command and control range. And um, 
uh, honestly, uh, it could have just been that I learned how to follow the rules. I don't even know at this point what my 75 points were for. But, um, and it was, I do remember that it was their social networking uh, app. And so over time, so we can learn, even I can learn, you know, not being a developer, how to improve. So this is my most recent score, right? I think it probably goes to 12,000 or something, but I'm really proud of my 3770 um, compared to my 75 that I can learn uh, how to break <laughs> the web apps, right? So again, I'm not the developer, but I can learn more easily how to break the web applications. So. Um, if you're a developer, if you wanted to go to the red team side, you're probably going to be way awesome because you're going to know what other things you can be compromising that I don't know because I'm not on that side of it. And it's also, if you're going to stay on the development side or do the blue team side, then you know what people are using to get into you. And so BHIS actually buys um, the command and control when they retire. and. That one's not free, right? So for $30 a month, you can play inside of their cyber range. But not only do they have the old web apps uh, that you can play with, but they actually have lessons built into it. So it teaches you what you're looking at at that web app. It teaches you how to compromise it. And so you can build it in a supported uh, environment. So uh, you already heard I have a huge bias towards uh, Black Hills <laughs> um, because I've learned so much from them. And so this is like, I think, a great opportunity. Um, and you can go on the website. You don't have to like pay the $30 to see what it's like, right? You can go in there and poke around a bit and see like, oh, is it worth my time? What would it be worth time for the people in my environment to spend some time here? So um, I think if you use some of the tools that I'm suggesting here, maybe you can be even better than a hedgehog, right? Maybe you can code a porcupine instead. Um, so again, that same week when I was building this, this job came through, right? And I was just like, I can't apply for this job, right? But a developer who's been through that other training, they could probably apply for a job like this, right? Like if you code securely and you're, um, you have that mentality of a secure position, then when these jobs come up out there that we have a huge need for, we can kind of like piggyback on that coder pipeline, right? And um, have our pipeline filled so that these jobs can be filled. So I'm open for any questions. Okay, so questions. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Be back, yeah. So it was good. Yeah. We were talking, uh, when you're talking about scenarios, are you focusing on like all case scenarios or just worst case scenarios? When I'm, like for the developers? Yeah. I think that they should focus on all scenarios, to, right? You know, and then there's always time and money and there's the balance, right? Because that's where you get the pushback, right? But I think that the, uh, oh, and I didn't mention back when I was going through the slides, but I think that as if you can have a system where you, the posture and the mentality is already, I want to secure the code securely, then um, you're going to be able to broaden that a little more easily, right? Because it's going to be already within their bandwidth, right? Like, so if some of the input validation is just automatic and they're doing that, then that gives you room to like add something more, right? And it's also going to save time, again, it, when the person who's doing the, if they, it's a big enough company and you have that specialized person who's going through and saying, ah, oh, you missed this, you missed this, right? If it's, and not having to have it be sent back. So I think if you um, have that mentality, it's easier to do more than if, than if you're starting from zero. <laughs> Any other questions? We got any online? No, we do not. No, not yet? Okay. So I, I have some stories that uh, obviously uh, through my many years of cyber experience, coding, hacking, pen testing, all that good stuff, I've been doing this for over 30 years. Uh, so one of the stories when you talk about secure, but, oh, by the way, I love that video. That was great. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. But one of those things, right? When when I talk to developers.
filters uh, through some of the stuff that I've been dealing with in the past is that, uh, you know, a big, great example is the, is the zip code field, right? Yep. So you ask them, okay, put in the zip code. So they design it, right? They don't do any of the input testing or validation or any of that kind of stuff. And so you put in 45431, the area code here uh, in the area. But then you're like, hey, well, what about letters and numbers, right? So uh, when they're developing this stuff, they should be only allowed to enter digits and not alpha, alphabet letter, right. or the, the oh, letters. Yep, letters yep. Uh, and, and so, you know, those are one, ways to test it. So I know uh, Daryl's got some great stories that he's told through the years with putting in percent X and some other things in the input fields. And, you know, the other one is uh, uh, Bobby Drop Tables is another great yep. example. Uh, yep, I know how to do that one. Question in the back. <laughs> And where? Really? Never heard of that before. So, yes. No, no. I'm just talking U.S., right? Yeah. No, no, no. I'm talking U.S., right? So when you're filling out and you get because it's a U.S. address, you know that's where the zip codes are usually. I mean, uh, that's the. You know, now expanding out into the international world, that's, that's a different requirement. But again, right, based on that input or even phone numbers, right? You know, how many times you fill out a form and you type in, you know, extra characters in there. Um, they're getting better about it because now it rejects it. It says digits only. You know, you can't even put in the parentheses for the area code and, and the little hyphen for between that. So they're getting better, they're getting smarter, that the words are getting out that, you know, this development is, should be, you know, doing this secure coding earlier in that development process. To, to well, that's right, right, like what you're saying, if there's a check, right, so like, um, if it says Maine as the, as the state, then it will probably, you know, the coder can write it so that it skips that uh, validation and maybe jumps to a different validation. And the same for the international. Like, you know, there are ways that the coder, I mean, that's, you know, that's the yeah. point, right? The coder should be able to, like, well, think about what is that person going to try and stick in there and how do we keep them locked into getting just what we want to get from it? Yeah, I mean, there, there, I mean, back in my early coding days, right, it was, let me get it done to be able to turn in or do the, do the job, right? Right, I'll go back later and fix it. Right? Sure, right? You've all heard that. We'll go back and fix that later when it goes to production. And what ends up happening? That that test stuff gets the into turns into production and it's never validated. So, you know, that's why we've got to, you know, provide this education and start doing the earlier processes. Of, of testing and developing uh, earlier in the life cycle for this stuff. So, because, you know, most typical programmers, they just want to get it working because then they're moving on to the next thing. They're lazy, you know, and they just want to get it to function. And it's like, why would anybody enter something in anyways? Because it says to put in a zip code. Why would you put anything different in there, right? Because yeah. that's the way most engineers, programmers, people think is they, they want to get it done. Mike, you have a I'd like to offer a friendly challenge. Sure. Are they lazy or are they being incentivized by the organization for a different metric than what you care about? Maybe True. they're incentivized by delivery of features and not going through and breaking the critical delivery dates. True. That, and I that, think, is, that yeah. is a good point, right? That, that could be that as well. And when you, when you say, you know, other incentives, right, when they, uh, based on features, Right, Microsoft Excel. Anybody remember a few years back when uh, you know they got paid by the line of code and nobody actually checked, and it actually had uh, flight simulator embedded because they got so many extra lines of code, and you had the right Easter egg. You were actually able to launch some flight simulator out of Excel if you had the right keystrokes, right? Because nobody checked or validated based on the number of codes. Was that was that on purpose? Well, sure it was because got nobody was checking. But that's an input validation. And let's do some like libraries within your organization, right? Because I think um, Micah makes a very valid point, especially when you're looking at some of like the agile. And you know, you have your two week sprint, and you have to get certain things done in that amount of time. And is that my priority? So building that secure posture as part of your culture is crucial, right? 
and then maybe incentivizing kind of like what you're saying, like, oh, I built this piece of input validation that we can add to our library that, you know, you don't have to, like, necessarily start from scratch. And so within your organization, having some templates in place that people can use for things that are done often. Yep. So uh, any other questions, comments? But I did want to ask, uh, you were saying uh, you were you're working with or, uh, Northern Kentucky University. University is part of the NSA. Gen Cyber Program. Gen Cyber Program. So that's a, is that a center of excellence through NSA? Or uh, well, is kind of so. Right, so thank you for giving me that back. So yes, it is a center of excellence. Okay. And um, so their program is a center of excellence, but they have also have like a, an additional uh, project. There are only 10 in the country. They only award uh, 10 right. uh, places the opportunity to teach a gen cyber class. And so um, Dr. Anker, and um, he lets you just say Dr. Anker because his last name's harder to say than mine. So it is a long uh, last name that starts with a CH. <laughs> Try to potty, maybe. Um, he was able to win uh, a, uh, one of the contracts to do the Gen Cyber, and he spent uh, two weeks teaching high school uh, teachers cybersecurity so that they can get it into their classrooms and hopefully get that idea of like, oh, this might be a fun thing or uh, to do when I grow up for the high school students. And it was a whole range. You did not have to be a computer science teacher. We had um, some generalists. We starting down like from the fifth grade and we had like a chemistry teacher and a history teacher and so we talked to them about like well how can you talk about uh, cybersecurity in the classroom depending on what your area is so you know I think that the uh, cryptography is easy to do in history right you can talk about it during World War II you can give them or you can the talk about Caesar Cypher exactly you can talk about it even in uh, the ancient history, so. Yep, yep. So uh, I was going to add to that, right? So um, I was very fortunate through my through my career. I was actually um, given a scholarship through NSA for it was back then. It was called Information Assurance Scholarship Program, and so they they sent me to school to get my PhD, and that was paid for by NSA. That's awesome, right? So that's that's how I got my PhD, but. They've, they've kind of changed the name. It's still available right now through okay. other various institutions, and they're now farmed it out to, to the universities where they have the Center of Excellence. Uh, and, and so that scholarship is still available for your – and they've gone – they've actually moved it down. It used to be master's PhD, but now they – now they also do it for bachelors, and they're trying to get it pushed down to the, to the high school levels as well. So, But it's now the um, – Cybersecurity scholarship program, but if you go out to NSA's website, they have all the educational institutions that are associated with centers of excellence that are funded by NSA to teach cybersecurity and get enrolled in those programs. So, if you're if you know folks that are trying to get educated, looking for extra help or assistance, a lot of times what they do is if you accept that scholarship, you'll have a, a job on the other end working for a government entity. Uh, where they help place you to actually then pay back some of that scholarship money. But you're doing work in cybersecurity. Right? You get your degree, they pay for it, and then you go, and then they, they give you a job. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, how often do you get to do that kind of stuff? So That's awesome. uh, it's, it's really a great program. So I am a beneficiary of that. And so one of the things that I try and do is actually also promote that because um, one of the clauses, so, so to speak, uh, was to help advertise or promote right the NSA scholarship programs. So there are a lot of institutions. It's it's grown quite a bit over the last few years uh, with NSA, and I didn't realize Northern Kentucky was one of them. So yeah, and the Cyber Academy at Muscatatuck is where I went, and is is it's oh yeah, a I've been out to Muscatatuck. Yep. Yeah, that's that's nice. The Cyber Range out there. Yep. Yep. I was there before it became that, but then they were making that transition. So that's that's pretty neat. Where you get to go test some IoT stuff. So Smart house. Nice IoT range out there. Indiana, so that was that's pretty neat. So if you get a chance to do that, um, the other thing I was going to mention. Um, so you were talking about oh, the Nice Initiative. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that National Initiative of Cybersecurity Education, right? That's uh, sponsored by NIST, right? So they put out all this academia stuff. They work with the, the various uh, educational institutions, right, and and try and help form. Uh, relationships between the universities and the businesses and stuff like that to help promote cybersecurity education. 
So that's, a, that's another avenue. If you go to NIST, uh, look at NICE. National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, along with NSA. So that's another avenue to look for for like scholarships for for people trying to get, you know, bachelor's, master's, PhDs in in cybersecurity, and then also to, you know, they help partner with uh, them placement afterwards for for education. So it's uh, here in here in Dayton, uh, we got Wright State and UD, and uh, they they also have cybers. I was a uh, adjunct. Uh, over at Wright State, they have a four plus one program where you go in your senior year, start taking classes for your masters, and you do the four plus one, and then you come out with a masters in cybersecurity. So That's they have awesome. a pretty good program. So you only have five years versus six for a masters in cybersecurity. So your your undergrad will be computer science, computer engineering, something of that nature, and then your masters would be focused on cybersecurity. Uh, UD does more of the. Uh, information management type uh, uh, or the business side of the house so that's kind of the relationship between UD and Wright State here in the in, in the Dayton area for, for our academia so yes go ahead Matt Sinclair oh yeah and Sinclair thank you and Sinclair they, they do a lot of uh, early entry-level stuff they help with the associates uh, and their and, and doing certifications they work with the, the various uh, working employee uh, so a lot of their other classes are geared towards the the working person. So they're they're either online or at night. So you can you know work towards getting your either your certification or your associates, and then transfer to Ohio State, Wright State, UD, University of Cincinnati, Kentucky. Now, so um, a lot of, a lot of educational opportunities. But you know this is stuff that uh, is is very critical uh, and. You know, you, hopefully, you, as you continue to do this, because you started in, in education, yeah. right? Transitioned into the cyber field, right? But these are different avenues that you can use to help with that whole education. And there are more programs coming out that um, are targeted at them. Like uh, NKU has just recently added, I don't think it goes live until October. You can start your certification process there, and then you can work towards your master's once it goes live in October. Yep. So, all right, anybody? Yes, go ahead. Is there an information assurance course in Cedarville? Yes, yes, Cedarville is part of, uh, they are one of the, they were, uh, I did a NIST, a nice conference with NIST a few years ago in Cedarville, yes, they, they did have uh, some classes down there that were part of the, uh, I think it was associated more with NICE, not necessarily NSA. So, but, you know, part of that NICE thing is, is they develop the curriculum and they share. So they'll say, Cedarville, we want you to write this particular class, but you have to share it with the other universities, right? And so what they do is, is they pick certain universities to write certain classes that they may be more uh, focused on or their area of expertise based on the, the professors that are there and stuff like that. And then they are asked then to share those modules to help other universities create a cyber program. So yes, thank you for that. And I think that's yeah, the way the Gen Cyber is kind of set up that yeah. way as well. So like the the curriculum that we wrote for that two weeks, we provide lesson plans to NSA so that they can put them out on their website yeah. so, yeah, so teachers that's have access to, to it. NSA and then they form it out to the appropriate universities and institutions and stuff like that. So. And also, uh, I saw where Sinclair offers a logistics database. It's like a background logistics. Logistics one? Yeah. Oh, okay. But are they even considering cyber? Because why would you purchase something that's not secure? Right. So, yeah, logistics is huge. I mean, we've seen that back in December. Oh. <laughs> uh, with, with supply chain, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> with supply chain, that's that's a huge issue, right? Because if you're purchasing stuff that is not secure, that, that can be a challenge, too. And they're, they're supposedly trusted... Um, you know, supply. So, um, refresh me, solar winds, right? Yep. So, the solar winds hack, uh, they were, how many locations did they get into? Because that was a trusted source supply, right, that we thought was all safe. And come to find out, uh, we, they were vulnerable all these years or for quite a while. So, um, all, good, all good stuff. Any Anything else? Any, any questions? All right, Penelope, thank you. Great job. Thank you.